Okay, so welcome to Dynamic Dunescapes in Wales, Community and Conservation. My name is David. My name is David Kilner. I am the Engagement Officer for the Wales element of the Dynamic Dunescapes project. We are joined by Nicola, who is the site manager for NRW. She has oversight of the conservation activities. We also have Ben Sampson here, who is the warden over at Crimlin. Um, so we can hopefully use their expertise. If you have any questions, please feel free to pass it on to them. Um, the project is funded by EU Life, a National Lot Lottery Heritage Fund and is a large-scale conservation project being undertaken across England and Wales. <clears throat> Dynamic Dunescapes aims to restore sand dunes across England and Wales for the benefits of wildlife, people and communities. Sand dunes are one of the most at-risk and threatened habitats across Europe. Dynamic Dunescapes is big and ambitious. We're targeting some of the most important sand dune systems in Wales alongside a sister project run by NRW, Sands of Life. So you might see them out and about as well. Dunes are a sanctuary to people and our wildlife. Their unique habitats provide space for rare and exquisite species, both on the ground, through our sand lizards, in the sea, um, and in the sky, our ground nesting birds. For dunes to be healthy, sand needs to be able to move freely, and our dune systems want to be dynamic. They want to move around so that those habitats shift and create new spaces for those specialist species that, in some cases, can only be found on our coastline. And in Wales, this is very true for a number of uh, very rare plants. Our work will see us potentially having diggers on sites, um, or perhaps on smaller scale, people and strimmers, as we aim to bring back some of this dynamism. So I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly now about how we're working communities. Before we go over to Dr. Charles Hipkin, um, to talk about how this landscape's changed. So we uh, want to be working locally with existing users of our sand dunes, um, those that would love to visit them to improve access and understanding. And after Charles has spoken, we will talk about the Young Persons Bursary, the arts funding that we have, as well as the two sets of entry, um, funding for improved entrance ways for access um, at both Crimlin and Bagman. Today's talk will be focused around these two sites in South Wales. As you'll see shortly, we have a number of other sites across Gower and Carmarthen. We really want to look at nature as something that we can all benefit from. So improve inclusion and access for other groups. Bringing the dunes to those that cannot get out at the moment, perhaps if they're shielding or would have difficult getting to the, difficulties getting to the coast anyway. We want to create soundscapes for you, film and capture some of these amazing coastal stories that I've heard over the last 10 years living here. <clears throat> we want to support people's health outcomes. It really isn't anything like a big, beautiful view over the sea, the sand dunes and their grasses and their flowers, the squawking of the birds um, to really uplift the spirit. And as the project progresses, we'll be looking at working with local schools in partnerships. So where are we working? So it's an England and Wales wide project. There are 34 sites in the UK and we're looking at um, undertaking conservation work on 7,000 hectares of dune system. 10 of these sites are in Wales and as you can see Baglin and Crimlin around Neath Talbot, Swansea area here um, this is where I'm going to start my focus and attention. 
We'll be working, the conservation work will be ongoing over the next three years. Um, and we'll see work across the Gower, and Oxwich and Three Cliffs, Clangenna, um, where Broughton Burrows can be found, as well as over into Carmarthen, at Pembury Dunes or Kevinsida. So why are we doing a dune project and why are they so important? Well, sand dunes are some of the UK's wildest places. They're pathless, they're expansive, they're thriving with life and they are on our doorsteps. So they're a great place for people and a great place for wildlife. They've long been places of refuge for, for various coastal communities. And we can see these remains in the very castles, villages, and old remains that litter our coastline and are quite spectacular. We want to take that history, uh, that incredibly diverse history throughout time from Vikings on the Gower to modern day changes that, we'll, that um, Charles will be looking at and bring it to life for people. Um, a focus on wildlife, but also on the people that use these spaces. So I've put together a very short video, quickly done, my apologies. Um, and just after this, we'll move on to Charles. So. So over to you, Charles. Okay. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Yep, yeah, thumbs up, fantastic. Okay, thank you, David. It really is a pleasure to be part of this really exciting project. Um, I've only got about 15 to 20 minutes to talk to you about Baglan Dune, so I've decided to take a sort of historical perspective here and sort of try and explain to you how much this coastal ecosystem has changed over the centuries and how lucky we are really to have this little bit of dune system which has really has survived against all the odds. So looking at this uh, Google Earth image we can see circled there in yellow that's a, a historical remnant uh, of what was once a very significant coastal dune system which stretched all the way from Crumlin Burrows to, to Merthyr Mow uh, and was more or less continuous all the way bar some sort of rocky shores in between. So a fantastically large continuous coastal ecosystem and what we are left with today is really a fragment of that. We are I'm going to take a sort of historical perspective and I'm going to use an excerpt from John Lightfoot's diary in 1773 as a sort of a background to all of this. This is one of the first accounts of um, which, which gives us records of the sorts of things growing in the coast of South Wales where we are today um, that, that we have. Um, John Lightfoot was an exceptionally talented botanist and he travelled all around the United Kingdom on horseback, as they did in those days. Uh, he was a clergyman, and of course, many of the, the, the botanists of the day were clergymen. And he was uh, traveling from Bridgend, really, towards Swansea, roughly along um, 
a sort of track which would have followed the Great Western Railway as it is today. It's difficult to tell exactly how, how he travelled, but roughly in that sort of direction. And when he got to quarter of a mile before Britain Ferry, spelled your Breton Ferry, as you can see in the excerpt, then he stopped, got off his horse and looked around and he made some records of some plants which obviously drew his attention. I mean, he didn't record everything he saw there. He only would have recorded the things he thought were really important. And among them, and I'll translate some of these into the English names for you, Ringia maritimum is sea holly, salsola kale, it is uh, prickly saltwort, onkenia, peploides is sea sandwort. And amazingly, he, he recognizes a, a grass which he'd never, he's never seen before and he describes it. Uh, and we know it today as Vulpia fasciculata. It used to be called um, something else in the past, but he thought it was very similar to Vulpia bromoides, but he, he knew it wasn't Vulpia bromoides, so he described it. This was one of the first descriptions of Vulpia fasciculata ever. And then he went on and he found the yellow form of the dune violet. He found some uh, sea spurge. Amazingly, he some, found some Asplenia marina, which is a little fern growing up the crevices of the rocks. And that in itself is interesting. Crevices of the rocks? What is he talking about? And near to where he saw the Asplenia, he also found some sea stock. Now, this is an amazing collection of plants, and this little paragraph of words tells us a hell of a lot. In fact, we could spend about 20 minutes dissecting everything that this guy is saying here. But basically, he's, he's describing a dynamic mobile dune community, which is really quite far from the sea as we know it today. We'll come back to that in a moment. But a good question we might ask is, how much of this has survived in Baglan today? So, We'll come to that too, shortly. So here's where he was, more or less. Of course, this is the A48, as it is now. He was sort of, as far as we can tell, somewhere in this region here. So he's got off his horse somewhere down in this region here, and he's walked not very far into a dune system, which has got all of those mobile dune species in it, which I've just, just described. And he also describes a rocky outcrop, which probably is in this area where here, this is like a, a rock outcrop behind these trees here, which, which is where he, he must have seen the Asplenium marina. So that gives you a perspective of where he actually was at the time. Okay, this is what the area looks like today. Here's the, the, uh, the, the Baglan Energy Park compound, there's the solar farm and so on. And what remains of Baglan dunes is just about here. But of course, when Lightfoot was traveling on horseback towards Britain Ferry, virtually all of this, including sand fields, which is beyond the photograph here, this was all dynamic dune system. And we've got some maps which take us up to about 1890 of the area. So this is a map on the left-hand side, or on the survey map, one of the earliest sort of accurate maps that we have in the area. In 1888 and side by side and complementary with it is an aerial image from from this year 2020. So just to give you some idea of what it was like this is all dune system here so this is Aberavon burrows here and this is Baglan burrows or what we call Baglan dunes just there and that area there corresponds to this area here now which is the Baglan Bay Energy Park compound and this area here corresponds to this area here, Dalton Road in, in Sandfield. So that just gives you an idea of how much of this area has changed uh, in the last sort of 120 years. And similarly, if we go further along the coast, I'm just adding this out of interest, we went, go down as far as Margan. Uh, here's the, the, the River Avon opening out into the sea there. And this was Margan Burrows here. In 1888 and there were some industrial things going on here there's a pit just here there's more of a colliery just there but you can see quite a lot of dunes still survived even at that time so this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying there is a sort of continuous stretch of sand dunes along the coast of South Wales from Baglan Bay all the way down through Margan Burrows and then to Kenvig which is down below and then Merthyr Mawr beyond that a fantastically large um, 
dune system. Probably the nearest thing uh, to wilderness that we had at the actual time. And again, to put this in perspective, look at this photograph of Mar the Margam coastline today. This is the steelworks. Most of this was sand dunes with a backdrop of what was called Margam Moors behind it. So all of this was Margam Moors at the time. Okay. And then this was dunes in front of it. And Margam Moors was an incredible place. Thousands of white fronted ge geese used to come here every winter. Thousands and thousands of them used to come here. So that just gives you some inkling of an idea how much this coast has changed and how much we've actually lost. So let's go back to this original photograph then. 1888, this is what Baglam burrows and Aberaman burrows look like, one big continuous dune system, okay? And then when we come to the 1950s, to house men who were working in the steelworks, Sandfields was built on Aberaman burrows. So all of these houses here, were built on what was more or less a fairly pristine dynamic dune system. But a large chunk of Baglam dunes, dunes in the 1950s still remains, and that's here, if you can see it in this photograph, it really is quite a large area there. And in fact, in the 1950s, kids who grew up in Britain Ferry could actually walk to Aberavon Beach across Baglam dunes. Uh, and, th and this is what we used to do. So anybody who's old from the Britain Ferry area who's listening and is old enough to, re to remember that will remember probably doing that. It's something the children used to do then. So that shows you how much was changing then in the 1950s. And by the time we get to the 1960s, of course, BP erects uh, a very large petrochemical works, works on the site of Baglam Bay itself. And so what is left of Baglam Dunes now is just this small fragment which is down here near Whitford Point. So coming back to this photograph again, you can actually see it. By, of course, 2004, the BP Petrochemical Works is dismantled, and that's left this very large area of, of open mosaic habitat or brownfield site, which in itself is extremely interesting. Uh, but all the sand dunes are gone. Obviously, they went by the 1960s, and here's Baglam Bay just outside there. So that's what we've got left. So coming back then to John Lightfoot's diary, you could ask the question, you know, John Lightfoot getting off his horse somewhere between the Battle Brook and the Traveller's Rest was describing a dynamic mobile sand dune system full of species which are absolutely specific for this type of habitat, species like sea holly, species like um, sea stock and so on and so forth. Um, he knew they were important species, otherwise he wouldn't have recorded them. So a question is how much of this still actually survives? Well, remarkably, quite a lot of it. What is left of Bagman Dews today is, includes a very significant amount of dynamic dunescape with mobile sand dune systems such as this, this is the forward inference. But very importantly, you have areas like this, which support some very, very nice sand dune communities. These are the sorts of open, mobile, dynamic sand dune systems which are so important in our coastal ecosystems. Of course, all sorts of dune systems are important for, for different reasons. If you take Kenwick dunes, for instance, such a massive area of fixed grassland, which contains all sorts of marvellous orchids and so on and so, so forth. But really, the specific part of a, of a sand dune system, the really important part of a sand dune system is where the mobile sand is. This is the dynamic ecosystem that contains species which are specific for sand dunes. Species like sea holly, you know, could disappear under the radar very, very quickly if we don't look after these sort of dynamic sand dune systems. So what's left of what, um, oh, what's happened here? What's left then today of what John Lightfoot saw all those years ago? Well, the sea holly is still there, still beautiful. The sea spurge is still there. The sea sandwood is still there. This is the dune pansy that he described, and he would never have ever seen this before. Okay, he describes it as a yellow dune 
uh, yellow pansy, very similar to viola tricula, which is actually what it is. And this is still there, of course, and, and, and this is one of the most important species of all. This is Matthiola sinuata, a Mediterranean species, which is more or less at the northern limit of its world distribution on Crumlin Burrows and uh, on Bagram Bay. So this is so very, very important. So remarkably, even though that huge coastal dune system has now been resolved down to one small area, we still have this wonderful collection of coastal dynamic mobile dune species. So if we summarize what, what I'm saying then, Bagland Dunes was once part of a massive co coastal ecosystem which stretched from Britain Ferry to the Vale of Glamorgan. John Lightfoot, an amazingly good botanist, stopped somewhere near the current A48 between the Battle Brook and the Traveller's Rest in 1773 and recorded a number of mobile sand dune species. All ordnance survey maps from the late 19th century on show that much of the coastal strip between Kenvig and Britain Ferry still supported an extensive continuous dune system 100 years after John Lightfoot made his visit. After that, however, from 1900 onwards, where we've got the development of the steelworks and so on, much of the dune ecosystem was removed and developed. But even then, a large area of dunes still existed at Baglan in the 1950s. But unfortunately, most of this was flattened by the 1970s in the building of the petrochemical works. Remarkably, as I keep saying, a small area of Baglan dunes still survives today and it still contains most of the species that John Lightfoot recorded 247 years ago. This is survival against all the odds. But this is last chance alone, and it's time for us to give it a bit of tender, loving care. Thank you. Hi there, thank you very much, Charles. Um, really, really interesting. Um, we have this fascinating, incredible stretch of coastline that, you know, from the time I spent on Baglen, many people enjoy and value deeply for what it is, you know, beyond its wildlife capacity. Um, we will be undertaking um, some small amounts of conservation work in the back of Baglen dunes. Um, where there's become some established tree and shrub by clearing some of that space it'll allow um, it'll slow that process and hopefully allow the continuation of these dynamic processes where we have open sand where we have um, you get a, a type of habitat forming called a dune slack where the sand actually gets eroded away to the water table fills and then you have these natural ponds that support a whole new set of wildlife. I'll just have a quick look and see if we have any questions or we can move into, we could pick them up later. Yeah, so we'll work into, so, so my role here is to work within our communities. So I briefly touched on this earlier, but there are, this, so there's three pots of funding um that we can use to support work in Baglan, the Crumlin and those other sites across South Wales. Um, there's also my time. I'm here to support other groups work in partnership with existing community organisations. So we'll just have a look at this now. Um, so starting, uh, we have a young person's bursary. Um, the fund can be used to support engagement with our coastline, to bring people to our coastline. Um, so this might be creating film or soundscapes or going out and capturing these incredible coastal stories um, that I've heard from the people that I've met while I've been out on, on Baglan. We have ships sinking in Port Dalbert docks. We have uh, you know, a myriad of wildlife washed up on our shores or, or seen there. Um, so we'd love to capture these coastal stories over the next three years and really sing about the oral history in Wales that is so deeply moving. Um, so 
there's this opportunity for our 16 to 30 year olds. We can provide or support if they want to deliver events, workshops or training, or supporting others to get to the coast. So the young, young people can apply for this funding, um, but they might be using it to support elderly in their community or those with less access. This fund is also there to support students undertake research on the dunes. Um, so there are a number of opportunities as we shift and change elements of the habitat to, through our conservation work, to monitor um, and understand that changing environment. The funding covers costs um, for equipment, transport, and we're, I'm more than happy to talk to individuals or organisations about how we can support young people to access um, this funding. Secondly, we have an arts fund, so supporting creativity in your community. I touched on coastal stories and that all storytelling, you know, anything from, you know, there's this deep history on our coastline. Um, many of us I've spoken to, you know, they, they were down in Porthcawl camping on the sand dunes of Mertham Hour um, as kids. It was there, you know, it was the right passage. It was, it was where, where people went on their holidays. And it's, it's fantastic and intriguing. And I think there are many different angles we can work with people to share their knowledge um, through the arts. So film, photography, paint, woodwork, a whole variety of things. We'd like to work with community groups or individuals, if you're an artist or a creative person, or you'd like to perhaps undertake a project like this. Um, you know, we're, this funding is there to, to pay and work with artists, to support um, kind of a greater understanding of our dunes or capture some of that history or wildlife within uh, communities. We will be over the next coming months creating some giant beach charts so watch this space it's uh, certainly something i'd love to see on avraham beach or something to to draw people in to what is a conservation project but which has people at its heart um so again please get in touch and then finally and specifically for Baglin and Crimlin, um there is some funding to improve gateway signage and accessibility for both sites um and it's, you know, it's really apparent that depending on who you are and how you use a space, um, what it is that you might need from that. So um, I, just, I used to live in Margam, so I have this an experience of Bagland. I've been speaking with dog walkers down there, local councillors. And actually there's a, a number of different projects along this coast that perhaps we can link together. So it'd be really good to talk about this entranceway project. Um, and hear from the community, hear, hear what your needs might be. Can, is it actually possible for you to access Banglen? And is, it, is, is there anything that we can do to support that? Um, we want to work with individuals, groups, schools, um, DWP, you know, if we can provide training for young people and they're part of creating um, this, you know, this entrance way or improving the access to this space, this would be a really positive way to, to use um, the funding that we can put into this area. Um, it might look like improvements to the entranceways, you know, at the moment we can't, can't actually get a buggy, a pram through. It might be signage leading through the dunes uh, to help you not get quite so lost or perhaps to support families to feel confident or, or anyone to feel confident to explore and have some point of reference. Um, it could be that we're creating mural pieces um, or artistic installations. Um, so this is, the funding is held there by NRW, so that's, it's a work in progress, um, and that's something that we'll be starting, well, we can start the conversation now, funding becomes available in March next year. So if together as a community, uh, we can pull together some ideas, some thoughts, some designs, um, then we can create something that, that's really useful for, for yourselves. And I guess finally, you know, the, the biggest opportunity here is that we can work in partnership with existing projects and services that already work along the coast or within the communities of Bagland, Brooklyn Ferry, Youth Catalba and Swansea, the university, as well as existing users. So I'm here 
to try and make all of those links. And I'd like to, if we can, create a bit of a network um, or, or pull me into one of your own networks to see if I can help and support, we can um, support people accessing our coastline for their health, but also if we can give them a little bit of the insight into the beauty and the wonder there, or the history, uh, or the stories there, I'm fantastic. So we've begun a little bit of this work, uh, connecting the surface game sewage, um, looking at running beach cleans and food and other such things in, in partnership, talking with DWP about how we can provide training that young people need or want. Um, you know, what I would like to answer those questions before we present something to, to yourselves that you may or may not be interested in. Uh, we'd also like to support the health services where we can. Um, specifically, we'd like to work with carers and those that are um, supporting those with dementia um, through the research preceding this project. We know that there are, and personal experience, we know there's great opportunities and great, uh, great benefits being able to take friends, loved ones, family to a space that's exciting and vast and full of life. Um, so if we can facilitate some of that and utilise our funding um, to, to help people access our coastline, then we'd really like to do that as well. We want to work with schools and families. We've just launched our John Muir Awards project. It's a free booklet with family activities in that can be downloaded off our website, both in English and Welsh. Uh, we're looking at creating borrow boxes of equipment for groups to use. Um, it's really, you know, let me know, get in touch. Um, I will find the time to talk to you when it's good for you um, and we can work together. So if you're someone that walks on the dunes or takes their dogs there, um, how can we help you? If you're a community group or you support community groups, if you're an artist or a creative, if you're a young person thinking about what it is you might want to do in this world as it stands, you know, we'd like to, use some of our funding to support you while we support this fragment of a, an exciting uh, landscape that remains. For those conservationists or wildlife recorders or those with an interest in wildlife and an understanding of how important it is for you know our health, for our planet, um, you know, we'd like to support you too. There are volunteer opportunities um, and and likely we can put on training to support your development into and see, you know, there are opportunities to work within conservation. Um, myself and Charles, I guess, are examples of that. Yeah, so um, I'd like to thank you all for, for signing up today. This was our introductory talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'm quite happy to open this up into a, a wider meeting if we'd like to you know if you're happy if you want to have a discussion around any of the elements of our work um, but my details are below you can find more information about the dynamic dunescapes project and then our work in wales at dynamicdunescapes.co.uk um, and to kind of keep abreast keep up with uh, what might be going on in our area if you're on facebook or twitter at Dunes Wales, you'll find me, but by, by all means, contact me by phone or email. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Charles Pipkin. Thank you very much for talking today. Um, we'll just have a quick look. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to scribble them down. I can't see them at the moment, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. So we've got a question from Alex. Um, I don't know. So Alex has asked, um, would you hope to restore the brownfield sites of the old petrochemical plant to a dune system if you get the opportunity? Now, Charles, do you know anything more about that space? Um, chance would be a fine thing. Um, th that would be a really nice thing to do. I mean, and th there is a, a sort of precedent for it in East Talbot because Further down the course, we've got um, next to uh, Tata Steelworks almost, we've got Morva Tip, um, which has been very successfully um, sort of restored to a sand dune like, like environment. So 
doing something like that is is not impossible but the chances of it ever happening um, in, in the future it, i think is really quite remote it's almost bound to be a space that will be developed this is one thing i would say about that space is that in its even in its current condition it is a remarkable habitat it, it has one of the highest diversities of plant species in the whole of glamorgan and there are some extremely interesting rare section seven species which grow on the site so even if it we can't restore it back to a dune system uh, as we would perhaps like to do we can still try to preserve some of the things that are there um, that, that are really very interesting it's just it's just a matter i think in future planning of people thinking a little bit about well obviously things like solar the solar farm has been put there we know that but when things like that are developed on that area of land it's just a matter of thinking of trying to preserve perimeter areas around things like that so that they still support these fabulous communities of plants and animals um yeah it's a very good question thank you yeah it does raise broader questions around how we develop our wider environment. Um, the Dynamic Inscripts project has our targeted areas um, that were identified in the build up to the project. Um, where there are further opportunities, you know, I think this is where we can raise the profile of those spaces in, in the time that we, we have to raise the profile of, of Bagland dunes. And you can see the scale of depreciation of the amount of healthy habitat that we have left in, on that stretch of coastline. And this is unfortunately the case for a lot of our coasts across England and Wales. So it's, you know, we're here as a conservation project, but certainly we can lead to places into the future. Yeah. Um, the one thing I would add, which I think is very important, and, and I, I guess that at later stages in this project, lots of these things would be covered in one way or another, perhaps by um, actually having field meetings on the site and other Zoom sessions and so on. But the, the, the whole dynamic aspect of dunes requires an input of sand. Uh, you have to have sand blowing in um, from the coast onto the land in order for the dynamic system to, to maintain itself. And sand is not a, an infinite commodity. It's a, it's a finite resource. Um, and this is why in many parts of South Wales, I mean, the, the, the coastal strip, Kenvig is a very good example. Quite a lot of the, the, the open dynamic four dunes is now sort of pebbles and, and, uh, and shingle because the sand is blown away. Um, so there are other factors here which are to some extent largely outside of our control. But Crumlin Burrows and Baglan Bay are remarkable. In, in South Wales because they both have, they both maintain this very dynamic sandy environment. Uh, and as, I've, as I said in the presentation, it's those open sandy areas that support the really specific dune species. They are found nowhere else other than in those habitats around our coast. So if we lose those habitats, we lose those species, you know, end of story. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I just thought I'd quickly say to you all while we're here, um, so what can we do? What can, what can happen next? Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with me, um, I'll just quickly put my contact details back up. Um, we, I'm looking to support existing volunteer groups that perhaps are already out in the area that want to do litter pits, that want to run events who are already doing conservation work in the area. Um, I'd like to you know, work with carers groups, um, people that have interest in history, in wildlife. Um, so I would really ask, I guess I can get in touch with you, just leave me your details in, send me a, a private message in the chat. Um, we will be looking at running some joint working events into September. We'll probably do a giant beach art on the beach and a big beach clean for National Marine Week. Um, but yeah, it'd be really interesting. There are a number of issues that are impacting D 
this particular habitat, um, but they are a fantastic space for people. Um, so I would also say, first thing to do would be to go and explore Bagland Dunes and see some of this for yourselves, because it's really quite fantastic. Um, we do live in an on an industrial coastline, and this is a, you know, it's the backdrop of these dunes, but the minute you drop into one of these basins, you wouldn't know where you were, certainly not within a hundred meters, a couple of hundred meters of the power plant. Um, the Wildlife Trust, so in terms of other organizations, we've linked in with Neath the Talbot Biodiversity Trust, thank you Richard. Uh, the Wildlife Trust, a lot of their, it's been a strange time with lots of groups on furlough, uh, lots of organizations and their staff on furlough. Um, so we are just waiting to find out who to contact at the Wildlife Trust. Uh, Richard, so if you can send me any pointers, that would be great. Um, yeah, do we have any other questions? So Ben said, do you think the dredging of the Neath shipping channel is a conservation issue? Or is it useful to recirculate the sand? So for those that aren't familiar with the area, oh, we might have lost Charles. So the, to get up the Neath, there's some significant um, boats that access that space, like hundred, a couple of hundred meters long, five stories high. Um, so it's a very deep channel to access, and that access is between the two sites that we're undertaking our conservation work on. So it'd be interesting to know whether that's um, how that's impacted the wider area, and perhaps you know these are two of some of the most. Baglan is one of the most dynamic sites that we have in South Wales. So perhaps it's been very, uh, maybe it's been beneficial. I guess there's, there's a number of factors. Um, Charles, if you're back, any thoughts on the dredging of the Neath Shipping Channel? Oh, he's just gonna mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw Ben's question. It's a really good question. Um, I don't know, Ben. I, it, it's complicated. Obviously, dredging is going to have an effect on the, the dynamic flow of sand. But as, as I, I'm sure you know, one of the things they've done on Baglan is to actually take sand out of the river, actually dump it, dump it on the dunes. And that has created a really interesting dynamic open sandy area. Uh, and in fact, one of the photographs I showed in the presentation was from that area where there were lots and lots of sea holly. I mean, I like to see big populations of sea holly on these dune systems because that seems to me to be the sort of um, the indicator that you're, you're, you're getting the proper SD4, SD6 type community developing to use technical terms. And that's where you're going to get the really interesting species like sea stock and uh, and all sorts of other good stuff as well that I showed in the presentation. Um, so I, I, I don't know, the, the physics of it is complicated. Um, whether you let the sun become a resource out in the sea for it then to blow in, or whether you actually take it, dredge it out of the river and dump it on the dunes, I don't know. It's, it, it's an experiment and um, I'm not sure what the right answer to that very good question is. Charles, I'm just gonna, I'll just pop that final slide up so that people know where to, to get in touch. Um, if they'd like to, to be involved with the project, whether as a person within their community who perhaps wants to go and capture some of our gene stories or an artist who'd like to run workshops or perhaps someone that works in a care home or community space that would like workshops um, delivered to them. Um, however, we can help. I'd be interested to start that conversation. Um, and contact details are below. Um, I'll just see if there's any more questions coming in. And then I think. Last call. Super. Um, if there is anyone that's 
in an existing volunteer group who works in the area, um, yeah, please get in touch. Uh, I'd like to host space for you to share, you know, the, the work that you're doing, but also perhaps any of the help that you need, whether it's recruiting volunteers or similar. Um, I can't see any more questions from those of us that have attended. Um, We've got a couple of our councillors have joined us. Thank you, Sean. Um, it'd be really interesting to work with you and hear your thoughts. Um, as we go forward, we're here for the next three years. So there's lots of good links and good work that we can do in the best way possible.